Yeah, more, a little bit more, so, no, no shells. No That's shells. Mateo doing shells, mechanics. solid mechanics, high still plasticity. Gonna be, still going to be doing the similar kind of thing. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Looks like we're about ready to start. We're going to have a couple of talks this morning around solid mechanics. Um, starting with Matt from the University of Luxembourg. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me for my, for my first keynote and the first time that I've been back to Imperial to do academic type things since I graduated. Um, this is my talk, a Bayesian inversion approach to recovering material parameters and hyperacid solids using dolphin adjoint. And I'm doing this work with, with Patrick at the University of Oxford, who's funded by EPSERC. Um, my boss, Stefan, who is on an ERC starting grant, and I'm funded by the FNR Marie Curie co-fund. So let's begin. So just an overview of what I'm going to talk to you about today. First of all, I'm going to kind of motivate what we're doing. So, so why are we interested in, in uncertainty quantification um, and recovering some kind of statistical information about, um, about the, the parameters in a hyperelastic solid? And the framework that I look at this, uh, I look at this problem in is the, is the Bayesian framework. So I'm going to give you an overview of that. Um, I'll start from Bayes' theorem and work through. And then the key thing where dolphin adjoint comes in is relating quantities in a kind of what I call the classical optimization framework. So gradient, so minimums, gradients, and Hessians to the, the Bayesian inversion approach. And so I'm going to show uh, a, kind of a, a proof which shows you how those classical quantities relate to the quantities, statistical quantities in the Bayesian approach. And we focus on a particular example problem, which is taking sparse surface observations of a solid block. So we have a, a hyperelastic block, and then we only take observations of the surface of that block, and then the, the problem is to, to ascertain which parameters we, are, we know about and which parameters we do not know about. And you'll see that in many ways, this kind of reflects your, your common sense. So Laplace said that Bayes' theorem was just uh, common sense reduced calculation. And I think, I hope to persuade you that these results may kind of confound your expectations. And then, so I used dolphin adjoint and a pet C for pi to solve the problem. So the experience so far is that dolphin adjoint makes things really, really easy to assemble equations, but actually solving them is, is the main difficulty of this project. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And particularly there, I want to deal with a high dealing with this high-dimensional posterior covariance. So we end up with this large, dense covariance matrix that we, we have to invert, and we, we can't handle that object easily because we have a large number of parameters. So first of all, why? Um, this is an anechoic ultrasound. Um, what you see on the left is your kind of standard imaging modality. You can see in the, in the center there, there's something, and that something is a, is a cyst. So typically, cysts and tumors have significantly higher stiffness than the surrounding tissue. And this is a product that's already available in Philips. You can get this in the hospital. You can see on the right what you have is what's called an elastography imaging modality. So you can see in the center, you have this uh, you have this uh, bright yellow spot, and then blue, so you're, you can visualize the difference in stiffness between the, the inside and the outside of the tissue. But you can see the, the, the scale here doesn't tell you anything. It's simply a, a relative scaling of, of some kind of stiffness property, some shear stiffness property. So there are, are more advanced techniques than this, but we wanted to go a little bit further. So there are already techniques that allow you to cover quantitative information about material properties, but we want to go a little bit further. So this is our kind of model problem that looks a little bit like the very complex case I just showed you. And you have a, you have a homogeneous region in the outside with a stiff inclusion in the middle. And the inclusion in the middle is uh, 0.6, so it's twice as stiff as the outside. So this is a plot of the, the material property, so some kind of parameter in my hyperelastic model. So I'm assuming that you'll listen very intently to Marie's talk the other day, so I'm not going to go through. Actually, I did discuss with her beforehand what she would talk about and what I would talk about. And so I'm not going to go into hyperelasticity too much today. So then you have your block, and then you perform some kind of experiments on it. So you might shear it, 
you might push it down, you might push it right. And then, we, well, you look at these, and I, I think you can pick out on the resolution. So there's a stiff inclusion in the center, and you can see here that there's, a, there's like a dip. So if I didn't have that stiff inclusion, that, that dip wouldn't be there. So these were the kind of two questions we wanted to ask. So the first question was, if I only have observations on the, the boundary of my domain, how much do I know in the center? And which directions and parameter space, so I'll explain more about this later, am I most uncertain about? So I have sparse observations, and I want to recover my parameters everywhere in the system. So the next bit that I'm going to show you, so I'm plugging for Springer here. I've not taken a cut on these two books, but they're really nice books. So um, the first book is Statistical and Computational Inverse Problems, which is more of a heavy read, Kaipio and Samasalo. Uh, I think they're from Finland. There's a big UQ group there. And the second one is more of a, a lighter read, Less Theorems, which is, is really nice. My PhD student really likes this one, Introduction to Bayesian Scientific Computing. And I've tried to follow the notation here so you can maybe take a look at the, the books if you're interested. So what is the Bayesian approach to, to inverse problems? Well, first of all, a deterministic event is one that's completely predictable. And then a random event is the, is the complement of that. So it's a, an event which is, well, not completely unpredictable, but unpredictable. And the Bayesian approach to inverse problems is that the, the world is unpredictable, which I think you probably agree with. And then if we consider everything as a random variable, we have a chance of understanding in some way uncertainty about, the, about the, the inversion process. So a little bit of terminology, an observation. So that's something that I can observe directly about my system. So concretely here, that's displacements. I'm going to call displacements Y, my observations of my system. And then the parameter is an underlying aspect of the system that I'm, uh, I, I want to know about. So here, that's my, some material parameter in my hyperelastic model. And then finally, I have a parameter of observable map, which in this case is a, some partial differential equation, which you, you give it a mu, so a material property, x, and it gives you, uh, it gives you an observation. So you have, a, you have a model, essentially. So Bayes' theorem. So the goal here is to find the quantity on the left. That's the probability that I have my parameters given the observations, why? So that's the, the goal. So given the observations, find the posterior distribution of the unknown parameters. And to get that, you simply take the product of two things. So here we have the, the prior. So the prior is what you know about your problem before you make any observations of the system. And later I'll relate this to, uh, to regularization. And then the likelihood, this is where the model comes in. So that's if I, if I knew my parameters, how would my observations be distributed? So just a kind of, just an ex, kind of an explanation of that. So I have a parameter, I put that into my model, and that then gives me an answer. Then I, I simply subtract my observations. If what my model said is a very long way from what I observed, then this thing would assign a very low probability to that event occurring. If, it, if my model does match the parameters, then, then this would give it a very high probability. So when you take the product of the two, so you then get the posterior. So this is kind of a three-step plan to solving these problems. The first one is constructing the prior, which I'm going to do a little example in Dolphin, constructing the likelihood, and then calculating and exploring the posterior. So and this is what we'll use Dolphin Adjoint to do. So constructing a prior with Dolphin, um, this, I base this an example from that Tan Wee Tan at Texas helped me with. Um, so the difficulty with constructing a prior is that it's inherently a subjective thing. So the point is, is that your prior will be different to my prior for a, for a particular problem. And that's the kind of main argument of the the yellow book that I showed you earlier on subjective computing is that there's kind of an inherent subjectivity to all of these problems. So 
the difficulty then is how to transfer some kind of um, qualitative information to a quantitative mathematical object that we can use in the inversion process. So this is a very simple example. It's a, it's a smoothing prior, and it involves a partial differential equation solve, so that's, that's good. And I, I did put the code on, on Bitbucket. So just a quick reminder, because uh, I know that I slept through a lot of my stats tuition at university, um, inadvisably, I have to say. And uh, so a multivariate Gaussian um, has the following form. So this is a, a Gaussian with, uh, with n dimensions, essentially. So you have, a, you have a mean, x0, and a covariance matrix, which is symmetric positive definite. And then the probability distribution function of, uh, of the multivariate Gaussian can be written like this, and this is just a constant factor out the front. But the main thing is that it's an exponential of a quadratic form with the covariance matrix here. Um, so you have the inverse of the covariance matrix in the, the quadratic form to construct the PDF. And then just a little piece of compact notation when a particular stochastic variable follows that distribution, we, we, we have this. So I say x is normally distributed with mean, x0, and covariance matrix, gamma. So the qualitative information that I want to transfer is that I think my parameter is smooth and probably around zero at the boundary of the domain. So I want to construct a kind of mathematical object that describes that. So imagine a parameter related to a physical quantity in one dimensional space. So that might be the, the concentration of, uh, of a material you know, through, a, through a continuum, for example. And then you kind of intuitively expect that the concentration where you are is related to the concentration immediately, a point immediately next to you, and a point immediately behind you. So you can write that my parameter at the point where I am, xi, is simply a weighted sum of one half of here and here. And then additionally, because it's the, the Bayesian framework, you, you say that you have a degree of uncertainty with that, with that statement. So what you do is you add on an extra convolution term. So this is a, another stochastic variable where W is normally distributed with gamma squared I. So this is a, a white noise type uh, normal distribution. And then you recognize that that's just the Laplacian scaled up to a constant. So you can write the system AX equals W where A is just a Laplacian <coughs> operator. Now what can you do that? Well, you can do it in Phoenix. So I won't go through the code because we have lots of time, but it's kind of clear you can write that in Phoenix. You pull from a random number generator for your right-hand side. You build your Laplacian up to a constant. You assemble. So then boundary conditions. So this is kind of interesting. So what you could do is you could set your Dirichlet boundary conditions to zero on the ends of your domain. But then you're, you're saying that my prior knowledge is exactly... I'm saying it's exactly zero. So you're not allowing any kind of float there. So you're making a very definite statement about your, about your parameter on the ends of the domain. So option two is to slightly extend the definition of the Laplacian outside the domain, and then you allow your, your value of your parameter to float in a way on the edge of the domain, and I'll show you that now. So you can do this in a really nasty way in Phoenix. Um, that's probably not the best way of doing it. <laughs> um, so I actually adjust the, the sparse matrix manually. So what this plot shows is draws from that prior. So I assemble that A, my, my matrix, and then um, I, I make Ws, my right-hand side, I draw from a random distribution, and then what I'm doing is, I, is I'm, I'm drawing visualizations of my, of my prior knowledge, and what you see is that roughly it reflects what I previously said, which was that I have a smooth continuation through, so I have a smoothness, that roughly, I think it's zero on the boundary of the domain. And here I plot the standard deviation. So the standard deviation here. You can see that I, you have the highest variance in the, in the middle of the domain and the lowest on the boundary. So if I show you here, you can see the, the effect there of extending that Laplacian outside the domain, that the, the, the values float in this manner. So then I'm going to skip to exploring the posterior. So I missed out the constructing the likelihood, because I'm going to do that later. So exploring the posterior, so what's interesting about the posterior? So 
This is a kind of hypothetical posterior. It's multimodal. So it has two kind of interesting points. Um, and one thing that I might want to find is the maximum aposterior point. So this point, that's where the, the argument that maximizes my posterior distribution. So that was a, this is a point quantity that you can find with a classical optimization technique. So immediately I think it's clear where Dolphin Joint, which is the package for, for doing optimization, fits in here. Probably less clear is uh, the conditional mean. So that's the, the moment of, uh, of the, uh, the posterior distribution. So that here for this multimodal one would be, I guess, somewhere around here. And then also you can do higher order moments as well. So a, a conditional covariance. So that's just the, the, the weight, the, the moment about <coughs> the, the conditional mean. So, okay, but where does dolphin adjoint fit in with this? So the aim here is to connect the, the Bayesian approach to classical optimization techniques. So this is a reminder. Um, my posterior is the, is the product of my likelihood, so I take in observations, and then I update my prior knowledge to get my posterior. And my map point is the, the maximization of this, uh, this, this functional, which I can do with dolphin adjoint, but there's, there's more interesting things in here. So I'm going to make a few assumptions. First of all, I'm going to say that my Gaussian is, uh, my parameters are Gaussians, that's my, my prior knowledge, so I say x is normally distributed with a mean x0 and gamma prior. Then I'm going to say my parameter observable map is linear, so this is, a, this is an assumption that I can't make with the hyperelastic model, but I'm going to go with it for now, and that my noise model is Gaussian. And then, so I say y is equal to ax plus e, so Y is my observations. A is some operator. That's my parameter observable map. So that could just be a matrix in this simple case. And E is normally distributed with some kind of white noise, gamma noise. And then the, the two covariances are gamma noise and gamma prior. So you plug all that in. So I take the PDF that I had earlier, um, and I plug that into Bayes' theorem. And you get something like this. So it's a multiple of two quadratic forms. Here's what I described earlier, so y minus ax, so this is the output of my model, and then I subtract that from my observations. So that was the, the thing that I discussed earlier. And then on the right-hand side, you, you have this prior term, and then the product of those two things, then your posterior distribution, the goal of the problem. So then what do you do? Well. You have this equation, which I showed you on the previous slide, the product of two quadratic forms, and then you take the, you want to find the map point. So instead of dealing with these nasty exponentials, you do what you always do in statistics, which take the, the logarithm of, of things. Um, so I take the negative log posterior, and because of the properties of um, taking a negative and a log, I have the same problem. It's just slightly adjusted, so the minimum point will be the same as the maximum point. So I do that, and then your exponentials disappear, and that multiplication turns into an addition. So, and then you just recognize that we have something that's now looking a little bit more familiar, and like in dolphin adjoint. So we have two quadratic forms, but the, maybe the difference is, is that now our, we have weights. We have a weighted norm, where the, the norm here is the the inverse of my noise covariance matrix, and my norm here is my inverse of my prior matrix. So then you optimize. So you take um, the derivative of that quadratic functional, and you can do this analytically. So that's very, very easy for this simple problem. You set it to zero. That's then your minimum point. And then you get this closed form expression for the, for the map point. So at the moment, that's kind of pretty straightforward, nothing, nothing very special. So there's nothing, at the moment we're just finding classic point quantities. So really the, the goal is to think about uncertainty. So what we do next is we take the, the derivative again with respect to the parameters. So I, I take this expression on the previous page, this one for g, the gradient, with respect to the parameters. 
and then I, I form my Hessian. So that's the gradient respect to parameters of G, and we get this expression. Now, what this says is that the Hessian is the inverse of the prior. So my prior knowledge minus the noise filtered through the adjoint of my model, and so it's filtered through the adjoint of the, of the model. Then what you do is, there's a really nice, elegant proof of this, but I don't have time to do it involving the sure complement. So you have the sum of two quadratic forms. You go to the matrix cookbook, and then you, you find this expression. It tells you that the sum of two quadratic forms is another quadratic form with these coefficients. And then you do a lot of algebra, and you end up with the, the following result. And what it says is that my posterior distribution, so something in my Bayesian framework, is related to my classical optimization quantities, my map point, or my minimum and my functional, and that it's distributed with a covariance matrix, which is the, the inverse of my, of my Hessian. So the, the result is this. Pi posterior is normally treated with mean x map and covariance h to the minus 1. Now, both of these quantities are available in dolphin adjoint. So now we've, we've made this connection. Then we can start thinking about doing uncertainty quantification in dolphin adjoint. So let's come back to the problem. So Marie went through this in really nice detail yesterday, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. So the problem is to find x map, my parameters map point, that satisfies this, this weighted functional. Um, the, the mathematicians might not, might not like this because it's kind of a little bit of a mix of discrete and an infinite dimensional problem. So you can pose this type of problem in a truly infinite dimensional setting and then reduce it down to a finite dimensional problem. But, and then my parameter preservable map, so that's my map from my parameters to my observations, is defined by this partial differential equation. And that is the, the, the residual of my, uh, of my system. So I have a hyperelastic body, is the, the fresh A derivative of uh, my, uh, my potential energy of my system. So you can see in here, I've written um, in the same way that Dolphin adjoint uses something called a reduced functional. I've written this and that. So you write your objective as a pure function of your parameters. And then you say that that is then equal to zero. So you, you find a minimum of this for, for all V that fit your all trial functions, that test functions that are in your Dirichlet boundary conditions and with your parameter in L2. And then, so the material model that I'm using is significantly simpler than what Marie showed yesterday. So it's just a, a neo hookian model and we're only interested in finding a, a single parameter, although that parameter is, is, um, in the, is, uh, does vary across the, the whole domain. So my energy functional is the integral of um, this um, energy density functional um, minus my external forces. And then F is my change of metric tensor, and then I have a left couch green tensor, and then an invariant of the the trace of C and a Jacobian with my deformation that F. So this is exactly the same as what Marie showed yesterday, except that up here I have a I have statistical quantities from Bayes' theorem in my objective functional. So how do you do this in dolphin adjoint? Well, it's quite easy. Um, you just pull off the, the hyperelastics example that's been there for what five or six years. And then with dolphin adjoint, you simply import from dolphin adjoint at the top, and then you have access, and then you define some kind of functional, and then you can define your control variable. So that's my parameter in, in this Bayesian framework. And then you set up a reduced functional, so you express your problem in terms of, purely in terms of your parameter or your control. And then it gives you, um, gives you callbacks that you can call to calculate the derivative and the Hessian of your objective functional. So I already touched on this. So 
wait a second, so that proof that I showed you is only valid under the assumptions that I, that I originally made. So those assumptions were I have a, a linear additive noise model um, for, my, for my system. The other assumption was that my distributions are, are Gaussian, my prior is Gaussian, my noise model is Gaussian. So in this case, I will keep my Gaussian prior and my Gaussian noise model, but clearly this is not a linear parameter of observable map, so what's the, what's the strategy here? So the strategy is that I'll use Dolphin Adjoint to track up and find my map point, which we can talk about this at the end because it's an interesting point. That would ignore the fact that there could be a multimodal aspect to this distribution. Then what I do is I evaluate my Hessian at the map point. So essentially what I'm doing is fitting a Gaussian surface or a Gaussian distribution at my map point. Um, so this is an approximation. So the assumption here is that my, my surface is, is my, my probability distribution function of my posterior is nearly Gaussian and that this is a sufficiently good thing to do. And at the end, I'll discuss why, even if that's not the case, you kind of have to do this procedure anyway to do Monte Carlo methods in an efficient way. So a quick summary of the, the process. So that the proof said that under those assumptions, my posterior is normally distributed with X map and the, the inverse of my Hessian. And then the approximation that I'm making is that roughly around my map point, uh, a Gaussian distribution is a, is a good approximation of my statistical, um, my statistical information. So what I'll do is I'll track up, find X map using a classical optimization technique and then start analyzing the, the content of this, this Hessian matrix. So how I solve the equation? The strategy is to use hooks in dolphin adjoint to solve within a Pepsi for pi based context. So I don't use any of the, the built-in solvers in, in dolphin. So they're all kind of custom written from, from scratch. And then we hook into dolphin adjoint from Pepsi for pi and solve from from there, so I'm gonna give you an overview of the techniques, and I think, well, I'm not, I'm not sure, but I think we use almost every every kind of package so in PETC to solve this problem because there are, there's an eigenvalue problem which I'm going to concentrate on in a minute. So the parameters of a map I solve using a Newton Krylov method, and the, the inner solve is a GMG preconditioned GM res with the near null space set. This near null space, you pass your mat object the the null space of your, of your mesh. And I find that for elasticity and high plasticity problems, this drops your, your, the number of iterations per Krylov solve by around 25%. So this really is worth doing. And then on the outer, so it's a nonlinear problem, so I have an outer Newton solver. That's a second order backtracking line search from SNES. Um, so luckily in biomechanics, at least the meshes that I get sent, um, we're not running on something as big as this yet, but they're much smaller than what people in geomechanics are typically dealing with. So the biggest mesh I get sent around a million cells, and this one's really nicely. So I'm a 16 core Xeon, so not a big machine. Um, I can drive this type of problem to residual of e to the minus 10 in about 30 seconds. So the performance of the forward problem is good. And anyone who knows Dolphin Adjoint well knows that getting that forward model to run quickly is the kind of crucial aspect to getting your inversion process to run as well. Then the map estimator. So this is finding my minimum point. So we use a bound constrained solver. That's, we found that's important to stop. If the parameter, that's my material parameter, drops below zero, then the PD is inherently ill posed. So we use a bound constrained um, BLMVM with more to end line search and um, I think someone had post us. We're not using the resmap yet, so you'll see in a minute we get some rather nasty, without smoothing, a prior smoothing prior, we get some quite nasty mesh dependent effects, which I'd like to fix. And then finally, we do a principal component analysis, an eigenvalue analysis of our, of our Hessian. So trailing, so that's the, the lowest eigenvalues of the Hessian. I'll go into more detail on this in a minute. We use Blopex, um, which is an optional compile from Slepsy. And then leading, we're using a Krylov-Sure algorithm, which is built into Slepsy as standard. 
So a reminder, this is our problem. It has a rigid inclusion in the middle. Not rigid, a stiffer inclusion in the middle. Um, these are potential observations that we can take. So under a, under a, um, a Gaussian prior, so this is a spectrally neutral Gaussian prior, you get something that looks like this. So the material properties of the truth solution was 0.6 and 2.4, and you can see we get this, so the mesh is aligned to this. So you get a very strong mesh dependent effect without using the Reese map with this thing. And then, uh, this may not work. I just want to show you that we can pick up, because we're optimizing with respect to parameters everywhere in the mesh, we can pick up very complex inclusion patterns. So this was Suzanne's uh, nice star shape that, that everyone likes. So I can't show you that because it's not working in the image. And then this is under a smoothing prior. So the smoothing prior naturally removes that uh, mesh dependent effect that we saw before. And these are all done under full observations, by the way. So these are full observation tests. So let's come back to the uncertainty quantification. So remember, I'm going to take observations purely on the surface of my domain not in the interior, and I want to recover the material parameters everywhere. So it's a highly ill-posed problem. So here on the edge, questions were what can we infer about parameters inside the domain, just in the space on the outside, and which parameters am I most uncertain about? And the strategy was to track up, find my map point, and then calculate the, the Hessian, which is related to my posterior covariance at that point. So this Hessian is not nice to deal with. We thought this project would be done quite quickly, but <laughs> it's very big, so it's on the order of the number of parameters that you want to solve. It's dense, so you cannot, so the aim for this project is to try and hit parameter spaces around a million. We're a little bit off that at the moment, but we'd like to do a million parameters. It's expensive to calculate, so every time you calculate, I think you do one adjoint solve and then two LU solves. I can't remember precisely. And we only have the, the action of this Hessian on a, on a vector within Dolphin Adjoint, which is a, a deliberate design decision because you really wouldn't want to ask it to calculate the entire dense Hessian. So the, the issue is how to deal with this, with this horrible object. And eigenvalues come to the rescue. So what we do is we wrap the Hessian vector action with an eigenvalue solver. And then we recognize that, remember that gamma, my covariance matrix, my posterior is equal to the inverse of my Hessian. And then if I found an eigenvalue decomposition of H, I can then trivially invert this. And then there's also a low rank structure to this matrix, which I'm going to discuss more in a minute. So the nice thing is we don't have to find all of the eigenvalues of this, of this object. So just a quick reminder, um, principal component analysis. So this is a, a bunch of data which has been generated using um, a, a Gaussian distribution with a particular covariance matrix with two parameters. Now along this, and then we do an eigenvalue analysis and you get the following two vectors, this vector is the, is the largest, associated with the largest eigenvalue of the covariance matrix. So that is the direction in parameter space that is least constrained by the observations in this context. And then this, this vector here the, is orthogonal to that previous one. And that's the, the, niece, the, the next least constrained um, direction in parameter space. And then remember, I'm dealing with a a huge object with uh, thousands of parameters, so I, I could potentially be looking at finding thousands of these, these orthogonal directions. So let's have a look at the, the trailing eigenvector. So I've solved my optimization problem, um, and then I, I've gone up to my map point, and then I'm now I'm going to look at my trailing eigenvector. So that is the, the direction in my parameter space that is least constrained by the, the observations that I have made of my system. So it's an inherently all posed problem. So we'd expect there, this to tell us something. So this is the, the map. So what you can see is that 
you have, uh, it does recover that there is a stiff inclusion in the center of this object. So the, the physics is doing some work for us here, the fact that we have a, a model of uh, hyperelasticity. And you can see that, remember before, the, the truth was 0.3, the center was 0.6. So this is, on a quantitative level, you can see this is quite a way off recovering. So we're 0.12 less than, than what we would <coughs> ideally recover. Um, but you can see we recover a stiff inclusion just from observations on the surface. And then this, which I have a better plot of it on the next slide because it doesn't very good contrast here, is the trailing eigenvectors. This is the direction and parameter space that is least constrained by the observations. And you kind of see, well, I see what I would expect to see. So remember I have sensors essentially at the edge of my domain. And you can see that there, I, my eigenvector is not pointing in those directions. So my, my parameter is well informed at the, at the edge of my domain, which is what I would expect as, as an engineer. And then as you move further through to the middle, across the interface, you, you have this big shoot up. So you have this large shoot. So you have high uncertainty. And then you can see down here, then you have a, have a dip into the middle, so you're also uncertain about the parameter in the, in the center of your domain. And then I plotted from across this, so top right corner to, to bottom left, as you see it. And so it looks like this. And then it's also interesting to look at the, the leading eigenvectors, so the direction and parameter space that is most constrained by the observation. So this is where we know the most. And this is the, the first leading eigenvector, this covariance matrix. And first we think, oh, what, what, does, that, what does that mean? How can we, we interpret this piece of information? Well, it's at the corner. So at the corner, we effectively have almost kind of two sensors because at the corner we, we can feel information from here and from here. So this top right corner we actually get the most information about that, that, that area in space. And then the next one is immediately opposite. And then the next one is not at the bottom, because at the bottom, I applied a Dirichlet boundary condition. So I get no additional information about the bottom region from, from my observations. So what does the entire spectrum of this thing look like? Well, it, it looks like this. So what you have is uh, you can see this rapid truncation. So this eigenvector, the, the most constrained direction, so where I have most information, was this fellow up here. So these are the eigenvalues of my Hessian. And then the least constrained direction was the one that I showed you down here. So what you see is this rapid uh, fall off, so this compactness property. And the reason you get this is because you're in most directions in parameter space, so it's a fundamentally ill-posed problem. Your, your observations were not enough to provide any extra information than you provided with your, your prior. So these directions were all informed, but as soon as you reach the limit of the informational content that you've received, you, you, get, you get this flat region, and then this, so you can kind of broadly split it into two regions. And then the region on the right were kind of directions that you already knew about for your prior. And then your information has simply informed this region on the left of the spectrum. So what that suggests is that instead of, and this, this matches a trend from FLAF, from a paper from a few years ago from Texas, where they looked at linear problems, uh, linear parameter observable maps. And they see exactly the, the same kind of trend. So the, the outcome of this is that I only need to actually calculate these eigenvalues. And I can, because I'm using an iterative method, I can do that very quickly. So on the previous slide, I calculated the full Hessian. So you guys don't have to. It takes a while. Um, to do that, you have to do 4,000 actions. So 2,000 to calculate H, and then 2,000 to extract using uh, SLEPC with LPAC. But then if I'm only interested in extracting that important portion, the portion that is uh, where my posterior is being informed by the observations that I make, then I only need 501 actions. So 
and that only actually includes 209. So I only need 209 Hessian vector actions to extract that important portion. So that's a huge saving computational cost. The other interesting thing is that results in literature show that this scales with model dimension, which intuitively I think makes sense. If I introduce a much finer model, but take the same observations on that mesh, then I would expect a similar number of eigenvalues to be important in this truncation. So if I go from 2,000 to a million degrees of freedom in my model, put the same amount of information in, the same number of observations, I still get this, uh, this truncation. And what, well, we started doing this, but we, we read a few papers from uh, MIT the other week and about implementing low rank updates. And so what I wanted to show you at the end was actually the, the, um, the covariance, so some kind of Bayesian estimator of the, the parameters, but we, we decided not to because we're not 100% sure about how we've implemented this low rank update yet. So in summary, um, we're developing methods to assess uncertainty in the recovered parameters in high plastic materials. This is done within the framework of Bayesian inversion. So I related that, that Bayesian inversion to the classical quantities in dolphin adjoint. Um, dolphin adjoint made assembling and those equations really easy. It's kind of seems like magic, but I know it was an awful lot of hard work. And solving them is tough. And then the next steps are looking at efficient low rank updates and Hamiltonian MCMC. So something I mentioned earlier was that obviously I'm making an assumption about my posterior being well approximated by Gaussian, but that approximation could very well um, not be true. So with Monte Carlo methods, these advanced Monte Carlo methods, what we do is we take that low rank approximation of our posterior and then we can use that information to tune our Monte Carlo steps to get a faster integration. So that's things we're going to be looking at um, at the back end of this year. So thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed my talk. Well, thank you, Jack. Any questions? And your prior looks like it's a bit too smooth for your problem. Yeah, so obviously it's based on the, under the Bayesian philosophy. This is purely my perspective on the on the problem, but. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we tried uh, TVD, so total variational diminishing, and under that basis of prior knowledge, so if I know that my object contains many distinct regions of, um, of uh, stiff material, then that, that performs best, that, that type of prior. But putting that into a statistical framework is it's not, I'm sure it's not impossible, but it's more tricky. So we're, we're making assumptions that might not produce the best inversion, but allow for kind of analysis and understanding of the... So you can make it a bit rougher, but I mean, if you go from, see, you've got H1... Yeah. So you could make it more rough by differentiating the noise before you convert the muscle operator. Okay. So you can make it like that, so, or L2 or something like that. Yeah, TVD, yeah, because non-linear and... Yeah. Okay. Thanks. That's a good suggestion. So you can use this type of technique for experimental design. So one thing you could look at is which experiment would be the optimal experiment to learn about. The, the, the parameters that I'm interested in. That would be very interesting to look at that. Is that what you asked? Yes. Yeah.
Yeah, so um, in the paper of FLAF, which I think is in Siam, Journal of Computational Science, I think, I think they show that, so they take the same number of observations on a finer and finer mesh, and then they look at the, the work required to extract the important part of the spectrum. So the spectrum looks the same. So you get for the same amount of data, you get the same truncation, except that your, um, you know, your, your, your tail is much longer. So that initial part. And then what you do is you low rank update your prior to get your posterior using only the information that you extracted on the, on the most informed directions. Yes, exactly. And also, more mesh is not necessarily a, a problem either. So you don't scale badly with mesh size for ill-posed inverse problems like, like this one. So this is a very ill-posed problem. Or I think they study a, a convection diffusion problem. Um, and they have like a big, they have like a 3D city, kind of a kind of pseudo city with skyscrapers. And then they show that um, you know, they have like a hundred sensors and they're measuring a concentration of some parameter. So, and then we're doing it now for nonlinear problems, parameter reserve format. Next up, I think we've got So quite high.